All right, it has some other announcements, but I'll save that for the service. I want to look at some uh, material I brought before we bring in uh, Robert. And uh, this book is called The Complete Gospels. And it has the four Gospels, of course, the Gospel of Thomas and extra biblical Gospels that have survived, uh, including some ancient Jewish Christian Gospels. Let's see if I can find it here. The Gospel of the Ebonites and the Gospel of the uh, Nazareans, the Gospel of Hebrews. Uh, of course, you know, if it wasn't for the Muslim conquest, we'd probably have all these books. But, you know, the Muslims took Constantinople and they, they burned the libraries. But sometimes you, you never know what's going to turn up. It's been 100 years ago, but uh, they discovered, I guess, some Orthodox priest discovered a copy, the Didache. And uh, the Didache is the teaching of the Twelve Apostles, and that was lost. It seems to be, in my opinion, it's like a gospel itself. Because it starts off saying, these are the teachings of Yeshua, of Jesus, given the 12 apostles they wrote down uh, for us. So here's in the back, we have fragments of, uh, it says, Jewish Christian Gospels. So we have a collection. Unfortunately, they only survive in, uh, in fragments. So we have five or six pages of the Gospel of Hebrews, uh, just two pages of uh, uh what is this one? The Gospel of the Ebonites. Ebonites was a Gospel of Nazarene. We got two pages of that. And then we have, you know, Orphan Sayings or Agrafa. And uh, Robert has his collection of Agrafa. Uh, so this is the complete Gospels, the great handy text. And as I was mentioning, you know, you never know what's going to turn up. I mean, uh, we thought the Didache was lost forever and it was found about, I guess, 100 years ago. And just recently, at Mount Athos, they discovered the lost acts of Philip. And the interesting thing, sometimes we have to, sometimes maybe God's doing things, you know? Maybe this isn't just coincidence that someone just lo and behold, they found this thing. Maybe the Lord has preserved these ancient writings. Uh, because around the time they discovered the, the, the acts of Philip, they discovered his tomb in, uh, in Turkey. Archaeologists did. Uh, but this was discovered in Mount Athos. And it's very interesting. Some lost ancient Jewish texts were also discovered at Mount Athos in the library there. And uh, Mount, Athro, uh, Mount Athos is like a monastery on a mountain. I guess it's difficult for the Muslims to get up there. I think the only way up is like a, uh, uh, like a cage on a chain or rope. <laughs> they have to have a little wheel to, you know, crank the wheel to get you to go up there. So uh, that's how a lot of lost writings have, just, have, have been preserved, including the... Uh, the Gospel. This one says here, Francis Bovon and Christopher Matthews utilized manuscript evidence gathered in the last half century to provide a new translation of the Apocryphal Gospel. Uh, sorry, this is the Acts of Philip. Discovered by Bovon in 1974, two years after I was born, at Xenophanto's Monastery in Greece. Uh, the manuscript is, the, is widely known as the most unabridged copies of the Acts yet discovered. So, maybe the Lord is... is bringing these lost documents to light. Like, I think it's very interesting that the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Nagamati Codices were discovered around the same time. And also, Eusebius, right? <laughs> this is by, this is a translation by Paul Marr. I recommend this. Uh, Eusebius, after Constantine ended the persecution of Christianity, uh, Eusebius wrote a history of the church. This is very, very important reading. Uh, and he also incorporates a lot of Jewish Christian material in this book. Um, and uh, of course he went to the East, he knew Aramaic, so he, he'd find these old archives and include it in this. So this is like continuing where the book of Acts leaves off going to his, his present day, the conversion of Constantine. And it's got a lot of information about, you know, the martyrdoms, the persecutions uh, under the Romans, so it's very, very important. Uh, and uh, I was showing this to Robert, he's going to be very interested in this. This is by well, the same people who did the complete gospels, this is the uh, the complete gospel parallels. I saw this a few years ago at a half price bookstore, and I realized that you know I didn't buy it at the time. It's like I need this book; it's very handy. Um, what this does is you have a uh, you know a parallel Bible where you see you know you got Matthew in one column, Mark in the other column, Luke in another column, and Acts. Sorry, and John and the other one. It so might have like some lines up that where, like when they're telling stories and stuff, exactly what this person said and it, what that person said right. about it. Right. Uh, for instance, well, there's some things that are just like the prodigal son's only in Luke, right? right. Uh, 
say, for instance, the parable of the sower. That's not in the Gospel of John, but it's in Matthew, and it's in Mark, and it's in Luke, and it's in Thomas. So they also they use Thomas side by side. Yeah, yeah. So you can see that, Thomas on there as well. Yes, yes. Wow. And this is really a, a, this is really impressive. Where you have the Synoptic Gospels, and then they have the Gospel of John. Uh, like I said, there's certain things that are, John. The Synoptic Gospels called the Synoptic Gospels because they're so so similar, right? John takes a wholly a totally different perspective on the Gospel, but there are parallels, such as Jesus walking on the water, right? That's not in the Gospel of Luke, but it's in the other three Gospels, including John. So I, I think it's very it's very interesting to compare and contrast the uh, the different accounts. So we have the Gospel of John, uh, and then and then this is really handy. He's got because this is something I've been thinking about a lot because a lot of Thomas. It also has the theoretical Gospel of Q in here. Uh, of who? The, the Gospel of Q. Q. Let's <laughs> well, So. There's a lot of material. Okay, the Gospel of Mark is like almost quoted in its entirety in, in Matthew and, and Luke, too, right? The entire Gospel of Mark. Scholars, but there's there's a lot of other material that's in, that's in Matthew and that's in Luke, right, that they share in common. So scholars think that maybe there is another source that's lost, right? Just say, for instance, the Gospel of Mark was lost. A common source. Yeah, so what you could do is you could you could reconstruct the Gospel of Mark. Scholars look at it and say, hey, there's there's this common material in Matthew and, and John. Sorry, Matthew and Luke, not John, because John's totally unique. Maybe, you know, they could they could they could construct. But people say that's conjecture, right? But but it's not because we know because we have the Gospel of Mark has been preserved on its own. But they say that there's another source that's lost, right? Which they call the Gospel of Q. Q is from link? it means well in drum, right. which means the source, right? Yeah. Oh. The source. Not, so, not, not so it's not a person, it's a it's a name they like a title that they've given the They should saw they should call it the source gospel. But for some reason they call it the, the lost gospel of Q. Okay. Right? It's theoretical, but you know what it probably is? It's probably the original version of the Gospel of Matthew. And since all of it was in the Gospel of Matthew, people didn't, you know, some they didn't preserve it on its own for whatever reason. But some people think that it's just a theory, it's not, you know. What language is it originally? Scholars think there's Aramaic sources to it, but they believe that that Q is written in, uh, as it is in the Gospel of Luke, and, and uh, Matthew is written in Greek. But uh, there's a scholar called he's passed away. Uh, was it William uh, Casey? He wrote he wrote Aramaic sources for of Q and Aramaic sources for John's Gospel. Where what he did is very impressive. Is he 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 used just the Dead Sea Scrolls Aramaic. And uh, he reconstructed, you know, uh, an Aramaic gospel. Uh, but anyway, I have his books. I need to go and I need to go and put my library together. Everything's been in disarray. You know, Dad died, and you know, all these tragedies. Half our church members die, and then uh, church is broken into, and they go ransack all my things over there again. And they they spray anti-Semitic and racist statements all over the place. It's bad enough to get robbed. It infuriates me. Um, so we have Thomas. The good thing, the amazing thing about this is they, they do a parallel. Uh, there are some certain things that you know, like here we see the blind leading the blind, which is Thomas thirty four, but it's also in Matthew and Luke, not in Mark. Uh, but well, this one you have a verse that's in uh, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Thomas. So this is very very handy because I was thinking it's like has somebody done that? And I already had this book, right? Somebody has done all this research. We also have the Gospel of Peter. Um, and then they have the Gospel of Hebrews and the other Gospels. Greek fragments discovered in 1 Corinthians. It's a very, very handy tool. Uh, by the way, the Gospel of, of Peter is kind of a strange Gospel. And uh, what a lot of the most ancient biblical texts we found have been discovered in Egypt because of the dry desert climate. And I think it's a carryover from uh, ancient Egyptian practices, right? You'd have the Book of the Dead. What was the Book of the Dead? <laughs> it was a magical book to help your soul go through the, what they call the Amduat, right? The, the netherworld, to come before Osiris and gain eternal life, right? It's, uh, I wrote about that in my book, The Aeneid. But anyway, you had this practice. They would, they would take that a book and they'd bury it with people. So it kind of carried over into early Christians. Is sometimes they'd have uh, gospels. It, there's a theory that the Nag Hammadi codices weren't discovered in a stone box, but 
the so-called discoverers found the ancient Coptic, you know, graveyard and took all the, you know, collected all the graves from the, they were buried with the people there. I think that's, that's possible. I mean, it's kind of grotesque. Gooch. They're grave robbers. So they can oh, we found a... <laughs> I mean, that's where we get the antiquities from. Egypt are grave robbers. Well, a lot, yeah. Well, they're doing that in ancient times. Like King Tut's tomb was broken into in ancient times uh, as well. Hey, so, um, all right, let's see. I think that's, I just want to re recommend these writings. I think it's very interesting. May I have um, a moment to introduce Yeah, can I please say that? These are two, two uh, volumes yeah. by, by Bart Ehrman. I want, who, I want to mention that. Who is an authority on the... Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, on the, the, the early church. Yes. Bart Ehrman's not a Christian, though, or, or believer in any sense. He's kind of, he left the faith. His story is he, uh, I guess he was grown, he, he was raised in a non-religious household, and I guess when he was in high school, someone shared the gospel with him, he received it. He was good at academics. So I think he went to Moody Bible Institute, and he's excelling in, you know, academics, so they had to, they're going to send him to Princeton. I said, this is really great, we're going to have a, you know, a, a, a believer <laughs> In, in Princeton, right? And we, that's true. We need to be fighting uh, these battles in, you know, in academia. They were but he biblical sold, colleges to begin with. That's true. Almost all of them were. And, and you know, the, I was thinking about it today. It's like, I need to let Robert take over. But these institutions started as religious institutions. They still are, right? This wokeism is an evil cult well, that's the, taken the over. The pendulum is going to swing back. Yeah, there's a revival going there's right the, now. The Asbury, Asbury. The Asbury so, revival and great breaking out of other campuses. I have read some of his books. Um, he writes very well. He writes academically where people can, you know, comprehend it. But uh, he's not a believer. He actually en engages in, like, uh, uh, anti-Christian activities. But he did, since he's renounced the faith, some atheists came to him and said, Hey, why don't you help us, you know, destroy Christianity? Jesus never existed. So he had to write a book proving that Jesus did historically exist. Because, I mean, he has some academic uh, honesty. But he did the, this collection here. Uh, I have this book. And uh, this is non-canonical Gospels. This is actually a pretty good collection here. Uh, and some of these books used to be in the Bible. Uh, he's got non-canonical Gospels. He's got non-canonical Acts of the Apostles. John, Paul, Tekla, which is part of Paul's Gospel. Thomas and Peter. That's the Acts of Peter. Was some of this written when he was a believer? <coughs> no. He, he, he left the faith pretty quick. Uh, so, Second Clement, First and Second Clement. So these books, these, he didn't author these books, he just translated it. So most of these books in, the, in this is, is good. He probably has the Gospel of uh, the Gospel of Peter in here, I imagine, because it's, it's very ancient. It's not as historical or as ancient as Thomas. But uh, let's see if I can find it. Uh, the Gospel of Philip is right here, page 38. So this is a good collection. He probably sees, he, I haven't read, this is probably, he's, he's usually academically pretty honest for the most part. So he's talking about lost Christianity. He's probably talking about ancient Jewish Christianity yeah. and things. But you just have to have a just word of caution using his books that he's renounced the faith. And I don't think he did it. I, I think he was like Demas, you know, in, in the Bible. It talks about Demas. Demas is working with Paul, but what happened? Never Demas, with us to begin with. He loved the things of the world more than the things of the. You know, he wanted. What did? Why did Bart Ehrman sell out? Reputation, advancement of career, money, getting invited to talk. You know, because if you're a hardcore believer, the world doesn't like typical that, right? politician. So it's, so it's in two volumes. No, 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 no. One volume is the Lost Scriptures, and that's that's a it's a decent collection. Um, okay, so. Yeah, I'll send back. Thanks for bringing those. And like I said, I, I think that one, one book is a good collection. So we're going to have uh, Robert come and share for the next uh, until 11. It's all yours. Thank you. Um, just uh, real quick. Um, this is, I don't know if anybody needs copies. I see you brought yours. I guess uh, I've got, these are kind of like the house copies or whatever. But if you don't have one, I don't know if you want one. This is a, a copy of the gospel. Is there enough, guys? Yeah, there's plenty. Um, okay. Do you have one already? Okay. So let me put Thank this, you. let me put that up. You know, like I said, we'll just leave those. Uh, I get a whole new uh, 
Oh, yeah. My uh, Ink subscription will reset here pretty soon. Some mm -hmm. more stuff. Okay, so basically, I think we made it all the way to Logen 44 last week. Um, so I'll recap here in just a second. So first of all, I just want to preface this by saying for anyone who hasn't been here, hasn't been uh, following all of this, um, what what my angle is and what I'm hoping to impart to you, you know, people here in the world at large, hopefully, uh, is that there is a, a sort of a top-down, outside-in way of looking at the scriptures. This is more the way of the the, the, the typical what we call scholars, what we call traditions and religion and that kind of thing, is sort of a top-down thing where scholars or whatever, whoever got together and decided what was in and what was out, they based on criteria that they thought was relevant or that sounded, you know, reasonable to them. If you go back into history and you look at some of the reasons why books were, t were accepted and weren't accepted, they were accepted on the basis of were they used in churches, were they, uh, you know, generally accepted? Uh, were they attributed to an apostle or someone associated with an apostle and that kind of thing? And so they have a list of objective criteria that they use to settle this issue. Uh, a couple of a couple of problems with that. Um, number one, there's not a universality of the canon. There's not a universality of agreement. There are different sects. Uh, some. Some Christianities today, for example, the Ethiopic, preserve as many as 81 books together in a single volume and call that their Bible. Uh, some, uh, even some Christianities exist. You talk about the Syriac, is it the Syriac yes. Church? That, or, which is, they, 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 they reject like um, Second and Third John or Jude. Right. Well, what happened was they never canonized those books. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So what happened is there was universal agreements on, you know, on most of the New Testament, but certain books were disputed. Mm -hmm. And so the, the Assyrian Church of the East canonized the scriptures while, uh, what was it, Jude, 1st and 2nd, uh, no, let's see, it's it's 2nd Peter, Jude, 2nd, 3rd John, the book of Revelation. Revelation. They never canonized it, but if you get an Assyrian Bible, uh, they print it in there, right. but the church has never... And, they have, to this day, they haven't canonized those books. So one of the Design. one of the yeah. So one of the the arguments really just at face value that would um, that would sort of tip you off to the fact that there is no such thing as a quote unquote canon is just the fact that there's this conflicting canons that exist, and so there isn't something you can point to and objectively say, hey, this is universal. This is something that everybody knows and that everybody accepts. Exactly. Now, the, the question that's raised is, well, does that mean that we have this thing called, sure. you know, that any old thing will do? You know, is there some criterion at all that you would that you would base your belief upon? You know, what I'm saying, what would be the, what would be, the, how would you know? Like, in other words, uh, okay, what, how could you? Torah, everybody accepts Torah. I just can't. But it, but I guess the, the the question that I'm raising, and and, and I'll get into that here in a minute. Right. But it, this is all sort of outside in in a way because it's sort of like, is it based on acceptance, right? Is it based on people's attitudes towards it, for example, or is it something a little deeper than that? And that's the the deeper aspects, the literary aspects, the sort of inside out sort of view of it is just an alternate view. That That's the kind of thing that could cut through a lot of this top-down, you know, authoritative or not authoritative questions as to whether or not there is something that is common between these books that you could look at and say, this exists in this book and this book and this book. There's a commonality here, and that's what you can look at, and that's how you can make these determinations. It's more from the inside out rather than the outside in. I'm sorry, you were going to say it? I was saying, except for, for Torah, Torah right. is the one section collection that everyone agrees as canon. Yeah, I think was it the Samaritan Church doesn't accept anything but the Torah, right? right? So they, <coughs> right. they exist as just believing in the five books of Moses, and that's it. Right. Right. So in other words, it's as, it's as far down as five books, or as far out as eighty-one books. So that's pretty wide spread. So how do you make these determinations? Okay. So my assertion is. And um, this is where I'm going to backtrack a little bit because I think I made it up to 44 last week, but I'm just going to jump back into 43 because this is where this particular point is made um, in Thomas, the Gospel of Thomas. Uh, the disciples said to him, who are you that you should say these things to us? Whatever things he was. I mean, I don't know because the Gospel is a little bit disjointed. 
Um, you know, and the, and the face value would be like, you know, become passers by, or you, but I don't know if that's the question that they're responding to particularly, but that's the arrangement here. But he answers them in an interesting way. He says, you do not know, realize who I am from what I say to you, right? But you have become like the Jews, for they either love the tree and hate the fruit, or they love the fruit and hate the tree. You know, trees have to do with teachings, and fruits have to do with things that come about in time, you know, by means of that teaching. So in other words, the fulfillment of things in that teaching, right? So if you saw, for example, the coming of Yeshua as the fruit, if you will, of the Old Testament prophets, right? If you saw that, then you might tend towards Christianity, and yet that would put you, quote unquote, at odds with Judaism because you're one or the other, or else you turn against Yeshua and you prefer Judaism, for example, and you reject the fruit in favor of the tree, so to speak. Because trees have to do with teaching, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that kind of thing. They just, they're, a, they're literary. It's all a literary angle. So if there exists between these books a common literary element, in other words, if you can, if you can discern that there are common usages of words between these books that cuts across the canonical boundaries and that would give you an indication if you have a large enough source I mean some of these some of these books some of these sayings are a little bit out of context and it's hard to tell from four or five words or something or two or three verses that you might have from an odd gospel here or there whether there's any truth to it or ever was any truth to it um, it's one of the reasons why I put together the agrapha, especially with the Gospel of Thomas, so that everything would be sort of in its own context, right? And so you could judge from a small sample size by putting it all together. Is there a, is there a, um, uh, how, how should I say, is there a larger picture? Is it more than just the sum of its parts? You know, and so um, how would you know that this book was accurate or whatever? Basically, you'd have to look for internal cues. You'd have to look for... What, and that's, that's what I believe he's saying, is that you need to realize what, who he is from what he says. So it has to be from the inside out. That's his assertion. And so that's the proper way to look at it. In other words, what we define as a canon may just be entirely false, may just be entirely bogus. Um, because there, you can't say anything definitively. Are there five books? Are there 81 books? Are there 66 books? I mean, how do you know? And based on whose authority? Right? If there was a way to judge these things from the inside out, that would utterly destroy the entire concept that's been built up for the last thousands of years and undermine it. So that would be like having the axe sort of laid at the proverbial roots of the trees, you know, or the, you know, the grapevine or whatever being pulled out by its roots or something. You pull it out entirely, right? You know, because it allows you to see it in an entirely different way. When we look at the, the Catholic Church, and you know, we have a lot of disagreements with the Catholic Church, right? They have a lot of disagreements but, with the Bible. Right, but we use the same New Testament, right? Mm -hmm. The same, the Catholics and the, the Orthodox have the same uh, New Testament we do as well. I think the only group, there's two groups that have different New Testaments, and that would be Syriac, the, the Assyrian Church of the East, which doesn't use those later books, if that's what you want to call them. And then the Ethiopian Church, where they have extra uh, books that they add to the New Testament. Mm -hmm. But I think it's important. And when when Jesus, this is a, this is mentioned in, um, uh, I, I think it's from the Clementine homilies. I put it together in the Ascents of James. And when Yeshua begins his ministry, he appeals, Yeshua appeals to the authority of Scripture, right? When he begins, he begins with, you know, why, you know it's just the, his inaugural sermon uh, in Nazareth, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what is he? What he's saying? He goes to Isaiah. Uh, you know, this is what I'm going to do: open the eyes of the blind, all this, bring good news to the poor. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He's anointed me to bring good tidings. Um, so when we see in the New Testament, the authority, I, I think this is uh, this is something with the Dead Sea Scrolls. Like when they look at the Bible text they have, they had several texts of uh, Deuteronomy, Isaiah, and Psalms. You know, these are quoted from often uh, uh, in the New Testament by Yeshua. Uh, they're also used by the Dead Sea Scrolls, Scrolls community. So the thing is, this is kind of interesting, that this argument uh, of the, the Ebonites, and it's like, to them, it's like, well, why do we use the Old Testament? Is it because the Old Testament proves that Yeshua is the Messiah? And they said, well, that's true. The Old Testament does prove that Yeshua is the Messiah. 
and that gives them credence. But the real reason why we believe in the Old Testament is because Yeshua, our Messiah, affirmed their authority. And this is also an early, this is also an issue in the early church. We have the Marcionites, right? And Marcion is coming out, and he's going to rewrite the Bible, and he's going to get rid of the Old Testament. And you know, they're, you know, we can't deny anti-Semitism in, the, in, in Western Europe, but the, the Eastern churches and the Catholic Church, they had to den- denounce Marcion as a heretic. Yeah, some of the New Testament. Yeah, he's gonna. He's gonna. Uh, Marcion rewrote the gospel, and he didn't like. He thought Paul was too Jewish, <laughs> so he like he purged Paul's epistles of, of, of Jewish elements. So this guy was a raving anti-Semite. Yeah, but he, what he, he tried to do, down. what what Marcion tried to do is like he was saying Yahweh, the, the God of the Old Testament, is a false god, the Demiurge, right? And the true God is our heavenly Father. So he's like, we're gonna, you know, so we're gonna reject all the Old Testament. Jesus is. Wow. A, which is ridiculous. This is what this is what Marcion did. Jesus is preaching that our, our heavenly Father, not not Yahweh. So he's ignoring Jot and Tittle well, and everything. Right. You know, what time so in much? history was so, it? About one fifty. About one fifty, because uh, Tertullian, you know, wrote what you know is writing against him. Uh, but I think the Marcionite movement existed. Probably until you know after the time of Constantine, but of course yeah, that's that's the movement Constantine grabbed onto. Well, they would have been. Well, no, he would not. <laughs> Constantine's affirming, you know, uh, the Old Testament. So the Marcionites still existed, but the, they would have been repressed by the Byzantine Empire as heretics. So they probably would have gone into hidings or gone out to the, the, the you know the frontier of the empire the same, the same because time. right and they eventually die out you know but uh, no they they totally like if you go to the Orthodox churches to, to today uh, with you know they quote Psalms and in, in, in Isaiah in their their liturgy and if you go to if you go to uh, these Eastern churches. They read, you know, you have a liturgical calendar and you read through Old Testament and the Gospels. Actually, if you go to these churches, they have an Old Testament reading, they have a reading from the Gospels, and then they'll have a reading from the Epistles. So, um, not that not that, that certain people weren't anti-Semitic, right? Like uh, uh, even, even uh, Ignatius of Antioch, uh, some of his statements, or, or maybe other so-called church fathers. But they are affirming the truth of scriptures because you can't believe in the Gospels and reject the authority of uh, of the Old Testament scriptures, right? Yeah, and, and all of this is very uh, affirming, I think, of what's been said. Because again, what what the way we understand the New Testament and its validity is that it is all a fulfillment of the Old Testament, not a rejection of it. He, Yeshua says, even of himself, you know that. Uh, you know, I have not come to abolish the law or the prophets, but to fulfill them. So everything has to be seen in a, in a way of, of, of inclusivity and in a way of, uh, you know, uh, ex- enhancing your understanding. When uh, on the way to Emmaus, for example, when Yeshua was traveling along with them, their eyes were being held so that they would see him on the surface level, but they would understand him from what he was saying to them, like what we just discussed. They would sort of see it from the inside out, in other words. Did we not? Did our hearts not burn within us? Did we not? You know, uh, you know. Did we not understand what we were hearing? In other words, what he was saying about himself being the fulfillment of all of these things, and so that's what it's supposed to be like. You're supposed to understand it in a sense from the the literary angle, from the inside out. And so that's that's even more or less in the gospel, basically in that form. But Yeshua's uh, uh, appeal was always to the scriptures, you know, and always to the authority of the Father, the higher, um, the higher level. In other words, I'm going to take you off track. Level. I want to mention one more thing, really quick. Is you have this? Uh, was it John MacArthur? And uh, he he wrote a book called uh, "The Gospel According to the Apostles." Excuse me, "The Gospel okay. According to the Apostles." And I was wondering, it's like, well, what, what is he trying to say? What is he trying to say? The Gospel According to the Apostles uh, was well, he's trying to preach Calvinism, you know, predestinationism, all that stuff. So I, I looked, you know, I was like, let's just look at the sermons that Peter and Stephen and, and, and Paul and, and Philip preach in the Acts of the Apostles. What is the gospel they're preaching? And almost all the sermons 
in the book of Acts that the apostles are preaching is that Yeshua came in fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies. That's what they, that's the gospel they're preaching. It's not not predestinationism or determinism or anything like that. That's just that, that guy what Jonathan Cothers hung up on. And, anyway. and, and so in like manner, this is to understand these extra canonical, let's say, writings and stuff, um, you have to kind of see them in a similar light. They were prophesied of in prospect. You know, all of this discovery of the, the meanings and, and the, the, the truth that it speaks of is coming in the end days where the last will be like the first and there'll be a resurrection, there'll be a restoration, there will be things set right, you know, that we will be led into all truth, that we will be comforted. All of these promises um, of rest and of uh, restoration, let's say, um, that's that's the proper light in which to see this stuff, that these are things that are being returned to us in various ways. Something's coming out of tombs, something's coming out of monasteries, something's coming out of trash piles. You know, it just depends on, you know, but it, it's coming from different sources right. and in different ways. Um, and because it's judged from the inside out, it's judged on a literary basis, that's the entire strength of this argument. It rests on the fact that if there exists a literary language of parables and of understanding of keys, as long as the usage is consistent across the board, again, that cuts across canonical boundaries. You're able to cast that sort of thing aside in your mind because now you realize you have a, a superior way of looking at this that basically undercuts 2,000 years of teaching, or beyond that if you want to include Judaism in that equation. But the, the function of this is to open up your spiritual eyes and your spiritual ears, and also to do away with the old, the old garment, the old teaching, the old you know wine, the old everything that, that has come before. It undercuts that by replacing it with something superior. In the same way that when Yeshua came, that undercut a lot of the teachings of the Pharisees and the scribes and old Judaism and replaced it with a better understanding, which is the way we're taught. And all of that stuff was in shadows and figures and you know images and that kind of thing. And that's what this book goes into quite a bit. Um, but let me kind of dive a little bit into it. So let me move on to 45. Um, it says here, the grapes are not harvested from thorns, nor ga uh, figs gathered from thistles, uh, for they do not produce fruit. A uh, good man brings forth good from his storehouse, and an evil man brings forth evil things from his evil storehouse, which is in his heart, and says evil things. For out of the abundance of the heart, he brings forth evil things. So there's a couple of things. Now, number one, the thorns. Um, we already know from parables that thorns have to do with riches, uh, things of this world that you get caught up in. Um, the grapes and the figs, it's very interesting. The fig tree... Uh, by tradition, and um, in some place like the Apocalypse of Thomas, where it's spelled out, or not Thomas, uh, the Apocalypse of Peter, where it's spelled out explicitly that the fig tree represents Israel. And so the grapes, the grapevine, or whatever, basically represents Christianity. So both of those things were embroiled in worldliness, right? That has to do with thorns. So in other words, worldliness or the riches of this world, the love of this world, etc., those are the things that choke the fruit with the Jews and with the Christians. You can't produce good wine uh, from, you know, uh, fruit that's been, that's been, you know, choked and cut off. You can't, you know, you can't eat figs, obviously, you know, he even cursed the fig tree, for that matter. Then no one may eat fruit from you ever again, right? Because it was not fit. And so, um, again, and it all has to do with good and evil. The love of this world, right? The friendship with this world is enmity with God. You know what I'm saying? And so these people who want to keep up the traditions for ulterior motives, for the sake of maybe having large gatherings, for the sake of not rocking the boat, whatever, whatever their motives are, they produce the evil things because they are essentially not seeing the true fruit. They're not able to bring forth the true fruit of the vine because of their love of this world and of riches. Um, 46, he moves on. Among those born of women from Adam until John the Baptist, there is no one so superior to John the Baptist that his eyes should not be lowered before him. Yet I have said, whichever one of you becomes to be, come to be a child will be acquainted with the kingdom and will become superior to John. So this is because what we were left by them is much more, um, it's much more, um, it's because of what we were left, not because of us, I guess is what I want to underscore first of all. 
It's not because we're great that we're given greater than John. It's because, because the teaching of John the Baptist was to, was to point out the coming of Yeshua. And he even says so himself. He says, you know, listen, I'm not worthy to carry his sandals. I am beneath him, right? He is to come and, and, and you know, I'm not, I'm not worthy is what he's saying, right? He's pointing to him. It's not about me. It's about him. So he's lowering himself. So in the kingdom of heaven, you, to get ahead, essentially, not, not if, if that's your motive, this is not going to work. But obviously, if you realize what your actual place is and you actually understand your place, right, then that will give you the proper humility. You know, John the Baptist understood his place. But the idea is that from Adam until John the Baptist, there was no one so superior to John the Baptist as I should not be lowered before him. Again, his entire life was led as an ascetic, and it was selfless. You know, he didn't have wealth. He didn't have, you know, luxury. He didn't live among the religious or establishment. Or, or, yeah, you know, <laughs> but he lived an ascetic life. And so that's not what we're being asked to do. You know what I'm saying? We have entered in <clears throat> upon the labors of other people. And it, the proper perspective is for us to understand that the credit goes to them and to, to the Spirit and to God and to Yeshua and the sacrifice that he made. You know, have a proper perspective of ourselves. So because we're given such great wealth of knowledge, such a great revelation, it's important to understand your place. And it's purely a function of their work. It's purely a function of their labors. It's purely a function of people who sacrifice their lives and their futures and their mystery and their knowledge for a future generation who would come to uncover it. The grace is a servant. Yes. Uh, so in other words, um, we need to understand that we are not... <coughs> We, we don't compare to him in terms of what he did in terms of his function, that the reason why we have this superiority is because, because of the effect that it has, the effect of undercutting the entire teaching of mankind. And that's just been handed to us. You know what I'm saying? It's just been placed into our hands. So that's the proper perspective is to understand that, oh, I'm not so great. At, you know, we, we figured this out. You know, hooray for us. You know what I'm saying? It's not like that. You know, and if you think that way, then you're, you don't have the proper perspective. Yeah, and think about also the, the spiritual darkness the world was in before. You know, Yahweh spoke to Moses and the, the prophets. I mean, here in the Americas, I mean, what they were doing, you know, the Mayas and the Aztecs, just, just so horrific. I guess that's mankind if you leave them to their own devices, yeah. right? Yeah. What were they doing? Yeah, these pyramids, they just abducting young men and women and, and uh Worshipping. Steal, kill, steal, the, kill, and destroy. Worshipping. The, the, you, know, you always go to it? Satan if you don't go to God. You're cause a, going cause to a coddle, whatever they call it. I mean, just There's Satan so himself. Worshipping the devil. and Because uh, you're going you're gonna to do one or the other. Right. right. And we're, 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 seeing, we're seeing that in this generation. Amen. And who would have thought? And then, like, like I said just recently, they had this big, you know, on the Grammys. And, and Christians that, that, everybody, that, 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 that was a red pill moment for a lot of and people. Then, that, yeah. that, that woke a lot of people up. And, and, <laughs> and, and CBS saying, we're ready Pfizer. to worship. We're ready to worship. And then, that's in, there was CBS, the, the Columbia Broadcasting System, ready to worship. Right. Then, you know, the, the, is this the Antichrist? Or? Right. So look at where as a society and culture. We, we've renounced the Lord. We should be, we should be very, very concerned. And we need revival, and uh, who knows, if this thing goes on, maybe I'll when go to Asbury and check it like out. comes in like a flood. Well, but that's right. where the next verse kind of comes in. Like, it, it literally says that it is impossible for a man to mount two horses or to stretch two bows. It is impossible for a servant to serve two masters. Otherwise, he will honor the one and treat the other contemptuously. No man drinks old wine and immediately desires to drink new wine. Uh, new wine is not put into old wineskins, lest they burst, and nor is old wine put into a new wineskin, lest it spoil it. And an old patch is not sewn onto a new garment, because a tear would result. But there's a lot of things here, but basically it's the old and the new, oh, the, the one master or the other. If you, if, you are, if you do not see the truth, if you do not see the light, you're walking in darkness, regardless. Even if you have the best of all motives, mm -hmm. the fact is that unless you actually have that light, you're still, uh, you're still walking in the darkness. Now, the idea of serving two nice masters implies a little yeah. bit more in the way of conscious activity, like I literally have given up the one for the other, and I think a lot of people are content with that. Uh, maybe they don't believe in, in Yeshua, maybe they don't believe in the truth, you know, and they feel like their advantage lies in 
you know, getting while they're getting is good, getting whatever they can, you know what I'm saying? As the world teaches. I'm not suggesting that that's the entire motive of all Christians everywhere. There was always a time to not know. Again, if something is encoded to later be decoded, um, that that entails the the idea that there's yeah. going to be a falling away, that there's right. going to be you're yeah. walking in confusion, you're walking in a fog. You know, there, the, the various Gospels teach this in different ways, but the bottom line is that there is a losing of the mystery and the regaining of the mystery, and you're either serving the one or you're serving the other, either consciously or inadvertently. Um, I think we're starting to be confronted with choice. You know, people in the world before, they're just, you know... There's no, there's no fence setting, right? Right. Yeah. It's, it's, I think we're... No middle ground. We're confronted with what Joshua said, you know, choose you this day whom you'll serve. If it's going to be these pagan gods or Yahweh, but for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And we're just seeing people, I guess, they, they're never really confronted with it before. You know, they're loving the world, they're serving, trying to serve God and man. And it's like, no, you, you got to make a choice that's one or the other. You know, like it's going to be with the mark of the beast, right? We just, I thought you started or the, or the verse 44. It, it's the, possible to be well I'm not going to mandate the jab. Yeah, and then he mandates that, you know. Yeah, it's possible to be well intentioned and, and wrong. That's okay. true. It, it is possible. Uh, you know, to 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 inadvertently yep. miss out on the truth because maybe you're just thinking along different lines or something. Um, and also, as we so, get closer, we, we see more clearly. Too. So, yeah. So, in, in other words, in the next verse, it says, "If two will make peace with each other in this one house, they will say to the mountain, move away, and it will move away.'" So, again, we talked about mountains last time. You have to sometimes choose, you know, judge things in their context. Because, again, this may not be exactly the same mountain in the same way that, you know, let's say the, 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 the water might represent if, um, if, like, the devil opens his mouth in a flood, right? His words, right? Water doesn't always necessarily have to mean God's word. It could be a flood of words from the, you know what I'm saying? So you have to judge everything from its context. This case, the mountain happens to be in the way. So this is an adversarial thing. And, again, mountains have to do... With higher places that are they're on the earth, let's say, you know, in, in contrast to a wave, which is like a high place on the sea, and the sea has to do with Christendom and the age of Christianity. And so when you have the wild waves of the sea, or these people are unstable, like the waves of the sea or whatever, they're talking about the religious rulers because they're based Christian. on the water, or in other words, God's word. Whereas the mountain, for example, based on dry lands, it's sort of a secular angle. So, but the, the mountain has to do with high places that are founded on the earth. So in this particular case, the mountain that moves away is, is a mountain that is in the way, or in other words, is an adversarial type kingdom. So what's the cure for this? Two, making peace with each other in this one house. Now it speaks of in um, uh, Peter about how the judgment begins first at the house of God. Right. And um, so... <sighs> I believe that that's what this house is. And the two making peace with each other is this, that the elect come again at the end of time to open people's spiritual eyes and spiritual ears so that they can have new hands and feet and eyes and everything so that their deeds, the works of their hands in other words, can be towards the, uh, the, 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 the bringing in of the new world and the new understanding, let's say, and they're able to do his works. They become his members or they're able to see with the eyes of the Spirit in order to speak the words of God, again, as one of his members, right, so that they can expound and exposit for the benefit of other people. But basically, if the two in the house, remember it was two against three and three against two, the father against the son, the son against right. the father. So if you, if you, if you give any, um, any credence to these numbers, the three of the people that uh, who understand the three <coughs> dispensations versus the people who are stuck in the paradigm of two, Judaism and Christianity, whereas we know about the Comforter coming at the end of time, we know about spiritually speaking, Elijah coming at the end of time to set all things right. So we know of future revelations, right? It's just the acknowledgement and fulfillment of those things that will bring those two into agreement with one another. Because presumably the well-intentioned people who only see through the paradigm of the two revelations so far can thus be brought into the fold, so to speak, where they can see the picture in its entirety. And if that happens in this one house, which of course is the house of God, which is the church, right, then you can say to this mountain, again, the, the, you can talk about, you know, the, this, this, the secular way of looking at things, 
right? Yeah. Um, the, the, the way that's grounded from the top down, uh, from the outside in, in other words, you know, where it's based on man's reasoning and his opinions or whatever, that that all can be pushed aside yeah. because you can see through it, you can see past it. So the idea is yeah. that if you went over the church, the entire edifice will crumble and the whole thing will disappear. Um, in some places it talks about being cast into the sea even. You know what I'm saying? So that basically uh, it's uh, swallowed up, if you will, by God's word. Um, and uh, let's see. Uh, Blessed are the solitary and the elect, for you will find the kingdom. For you are from it, and to it you will return. So again, the solitary and the elect, the reason why you have to be solitary is because it's not based on tradition. It's not based on other people's teachings. It's not based on the consensus reality. This is someone who's coming at it from an entirely different point of view that's... Yeah. Uh, I want to mention, uh, like, Billy Graham's he's got this magazine called Decision. And the Catholic Church and the Orthodox, and they baptize babies, it's like, oh, well, because we're, we're the body of Christ, we're the church. But the fact, that's true. But each one of us has to come to the Lord in a solitary mm -hmm. manner to make a decision for yourself. And, and it's not like somebody can't make this decision for you. You have to come as a solitary person and make that decision for the Lord. See, that's why I'm really hesitant myself to try and isolate it to this church or that or this group or that because by, by undercutting the entire edifice, that means that regardless of their motives, regardless of their guilt, everybody's all caught up in that illusion and that they're wrong, you know what I'm saying, or that they're, they're mistaken. Uh -huh. We're going to have to conclude. You want to do 50 and then we'll close after that. Okay, that's fine. And so, but again, the, the, they are chosen because, again, the elect are those who come at the end of time, at the end of the age. And so they find the kingdom, right? The kingdom that's been hidden, in other words. And it, because, because, because they come from the place of truth, because they come from the eternity, right? They're able to recognize that in the, the mystery and in the kingdom, and so they're able to, again, uh, articulate it. And so that brings up questions, like, well, where did this all come from, right? So it, in 50, it concludes with that. It says, if they say to you, where did you come from? Say to them, we came from the light, from a place where the light came into being on its own accord and established itself and became manifest through their image. Um, so let's just start with that. So. What, what do we speak of as images? In, in Hebrews, it talks about images of and, and shadows of things to come, right? As being um, a picture language or uh, something, you know, there to uh, demonstrate something beyond itself, something <coughs> greater than itself. Like the earthly high priest is there to symbolize, let's say, what is our true heavenly high priest, the one that's actually at the right hand of the Father. So in, in, in that way, it's a shadow. So when you see the concept of image, when you see the concept of, of forms and, and that kind of thing, you have to think parabolically. You have to think in terms of parables and parabolic language. Um, and so it, with the fact that it established itself, well, I mean, we've been given these scriptures. They've been sitting there for thousands of years, right? So all of the, 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 the truth or whatever that comes out of that is because it's all been sitting there all this time in the form of images and parables and, and hidden language you know, to be discovered, you know, so it came about on its own. We didn't do this. We didn't produce this stuff. It was all handed to us, right? And it said, when then they ask you, well, is it you? You say, well, we are its children. We are the elect of the living father. Because, oh, again, so he talks about blessed are the solitary and the elect. They're, um, they're equated with children. So when you see the concept of children, Right, then that's connected with the concept of the elect or those who are chosen by the living Father. And again, we talk about living and dying, right? The, whoever comes to understand these words will not taste of death. So the tasting of death is a function of our ignorance of these words or our inability to understand them. So living is the opposite of that, just by way of corollary. Um, that the living Father is the, it's to understand the living word, uh, to come alive is to understand the secret language or the hidden language. And then it says, and then again, it concludes, what is the sign, um, if they ask you, what is the sign of your father in you, say to them, it is movement and repose. And again, movement, agitation, 
that has to do with the struggle to come to understand these truths. You're, you have to seek to find. You have to knock in order to have the door open to you. Right? You have to ask in order to have that give it to you. So that's the seeking, that's the agitation, that's the working through of it. And then the rest is when you come to understand um, what the actual truth is and no longer are seeking for it, asking for it. You know, it's it's there to be, you know, to be given to you. Thank you, Mark. We'll come and continue some other time. Sure. I want you to continue the, uh, I think the, you did some good teachings on the, the harrowing of hell, but once we go through Thomas, I'd like to get back on that again sometime. Sure. So, we're going to have a reaffirmation of vows during the service today for uh, for Terry and Jamie. Great. All right. Great. So let's uh, let's bow our heads for the sports service. Father, we thank you for your blessings. We thank you for your word, which you spoke to us, and pray that people would see your life in us, that we would show through our, our deeds. Uh, and our, our witness that we are children of our, the living, the ever living and mighty God. And help us, Lord, to receive your word of truth. We grow spiritually and we conform to the image of your pure Son, our Lord and Savior, Yeshua the Messiah. As we pray, amen. Jeff is here with the shofar. So, I'm going to do the Hebrew blessing and we'll get started. Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Malach HaAlam Asher Kishanim Mesutah Yisavanim Yishmoah Kol HaShofar Amen. Blessed art thou, O Yahweh, our Lord, our Elohim, our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us by his commandments, has commanded us to hear, heed, listen to, and obey the voice or the sound of the shofar, which is the ram's horn. We had a cootie horn today. <laughs> Today, I guess we're running late. We might do a uh, reaffirmation of vows for Jamie and Terry if they are able to come. Michael Griffith's going to bring some goodies, but he's running late. He'll be here at 11. 